Alright, so we're getting ready to do our Q&A and look at where any questions y'all want, we're going to open up in prayer first and we'll go forward with it. Let y'all shoot away. Alright, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your blessings tonight. We thank you, Lord, for being able to gather around this book, Lord. This book is hated by a lot of people today, and it's reviled and rejected and laid aside and not taken seriously like it should be. Lord, we here at this church, we want to glorify this book, and we want to praise it, and we want to lift it up as we lift you up and as we glorify and praise you. And we love you, Lord, and we take this time tonight to take a moment to answer questions that the congregation might have concerning your word. Give me the wisdom, the knowledge, the understanding to be able to give the answers and help us to seek and search the scriptures for the truth, Lord. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so um, who wants to go first? <laughs> all right, go ahead. Yeah, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Okay. Uh, about, the, about the gifts. Uh, I know there's some controversy about that. So are, they, are they applicable today? Um, I guess would be the, the question. Alright, so the question is 1 Corinthians 14, where it talks about the gifts of the Spirit. Which actually, if you want to know where the gifts are, it's going to be chapter 12, and also Romans chapter 12. And with that, you're going to have to go to Ephesians too. Romans 12, and then you're going to have to go to Mark 16. See what I mean? You get into this thing with the gifts, it's not just one verse, or two verses here and there. You've got to take a whole variety of verses and... Put them together to get a picture of what God's talking about. So let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 12. And let's look at this one first. Alright, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. The Bible says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away, away under these dumb idols, even as you were led. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. Now that's the first thing you want to know. That word right there. Jesus is what? The Lord. Now you notice in the charismatic movement, a peculiar thing starts happening. When they quote that verse, they don't quote it right. They pick out the D. If you ever watch, ever see Kenneth Copeland, and he's got that big banner behind him, you know, it's yeah. Jesus is what? It's Jesus is Lord. Here out the D, the definite article. Yeah. Okay? Now, the Holy Ghost told you that you can't say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. Subtle difference there. A lost man can say that Jesus is Lord. That, a lost man will make that profession. But he will not say Jesus is the Lord to the exclusion of all others. If he does, he's saved. <laughs> he's not lost anymore. Um, you know that by looking at uh, Philippians. 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 Chapter. Are you recording this, Pastor Mark? Sir? Are you recording this? Yes, sir. All right, great. All right, Philippians chapter... Let's see, where is it at here? Let's see. Is it Philippians? I thought it was. Let's see. Let me find it, somebody. All right, here it is. Here it is. Philippians chapter 2. The Bible says in verse 9, Wherefore God, hath, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, 
that at the name of Jesus every knee should it don't say shall should bow of things in heaven things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So what you're going to have at the great white throne judgment, a bunch of people that's being forced to acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord. But they're not going to bow their knee to him and say he is the Lord. That's the, that is the confession of a saved man only, according to 1 Corinthians 12. That's the first thing you want to note in this thing concerning gifts. Now let's go back. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are di differences of administrations, but the same Lord, and there are diversities of operations, but it's the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. Alright, first thing you want to write down is the word of wisdom. Purpose of the word of wisdom. I know where I can get the word of wisdom at today. That's right. Well, that's, that's your first clue right there. All right. Let's read the next one. All right. The Bible says to another, the word of knowledge. All right. Um, 1 Corinthians 14. No, 1 Corinthians 12, I'm sorry. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 8. Alright, we know that's the Word of God. Based on Proverbs, we also know that's the Word of God. Curious things going on here. Before the canon of the Holy Scriptures was closed, these gifts were given to give those people supernaturally the Word of God. With me? Keep reading. To another, faith by the same Spirit. My Bible tells me that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the See, uh, strange things start to emerge here. It's connected to the Word of God. <clears throat> All right. The Bible says, now here's where we get into an interesting thing. To another, the gifts of healing. And then it's going to say uh, the, the following things, and I'm going to write them down. To another, the working of miracles. So we've got... Alright, so we've got a category. Now we've got gifts of healing. Miracles. Somebody read the rest of that to me as I'm going through writing this down. So I'll keep stepping up and down. So you got gifts of healing. Miracles. What's the next one? Prophecy. No prophecy. Now that comes back to Scripture. Yeah. How do you know that? Oh, just a minute, buddy. Let me show you something here on prophecy. Prophecy. Here we go. Here it is. Go to Second Peter one twenty, and then we'll pick up what she's talking about. Second Peter one twenty. Somebody read that to me when you get it. Second Peter one twenty. Thank <laughs> you. 
The Bible says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the what? Scripture. Is of any private and pers- uh, interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake, as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now, prophecy is connected to the Scriptures. All right, what's the next one, Carrie? Okay. You got discerning the spirits. Take your Bible and go to 1 John. John chapter 4. First John chapter 4 verse 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit, now notice that spirit, there's a lowercase s, that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Did your Bible confess that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh? Then you got the right Bible. Did you notice some Bibles out there today that don't confess that? Puts a whole new light on it, don't it? And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist. Where have you have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world? You have God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world. And the world heareth them. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth. Sanctified him through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And the spirit of error. The spirit of error is going to be anything scripturally that don't line up with this one. All right, now uh, another verse to cross-reference. And that's going to be first. Uh, excuse me, it's going to be John. And I want to say it's chapter... Let me look at it real quick. Let's see. John chapter 5. John chapter 5, verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, go down here to verse... Um, go down here to verse 37. And the Father himself, which hath sent me, hath borne witness to me, you have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his shape. You have not his word abiding in you for whom he hath sent. Him ye believe not. Search the scriptures. For in them ye think you have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. Go to chapter 8. Same book. Let's see. I think it's chapter 8. Hold on a minute. I might, I might be wrong on that. Let me see. Yeah. Chapter 8 and go down here to verse 43. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. You're of your father the devil and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? 
he that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. It goes right there to the discerning spirits. You got a Bible that helps you discern. You don't need no guru somewhere on the backside of a desert telling you what's right and what's wrong and what's real and what's not real. You've got a Bible. As a matter of fact, you've got two things at your disposal that nobody in the world has. You've got a Bible and you've got the Holy Ghost on the inside of you. Go to 1 John. 1 John chapter 2. First John chapter 2 verse 27. But the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you. You need not that any man teach you. For as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. The Holy Ghost that's on the inside of you points you to this one right here. Discernment comes from reading the Holy Scriptures. Discernment is not going to a prophecy conference where they teach you how to speak in tongues and prophesy. Discernment comes from the Word of God. So that one connects there. Let's go back to uh, Romans chapter 12 again. Not Romans, but uh, 1 Corinthians 12. Let's keep reading. So far, I've given you things that all connect to the Scriptures. All right, the working of miracles we've covered. We've covered discerning of spirits to another diverse kinds of tongues. Now, you want to note that. Notice what it does not say. It does not say unknown tongues. It does not say other tongues. It says diverse kinds of tongues. That is a gift of the Spirit. What does that mean? You're able to take that book and put it in different languages. Like they did over there in the Ukraine when they made a Russian Bible out of a King James Bible. We're going to get into the whole tongues thing in a minute, but I want you to see these parts first. And notice how it's worded. Because there's not a charismatic in the world that knows how to read. They don't know how to read the verses. They read into them thing. I was a charismatic. I was a Pentecostal. I, I, I'm, I, I'm like Paul. I was a Pentecostal of the Pentecostals. I know what they believe. Okay? I know them like the back of my hand. And I'm telling you, they take these verses and they twist them. Now watch. Uh, we, got the ver we got the verses there in chapter 12. Now let's go to chapter 14. <clears throat> and let's look at these verses real quick. I'm going to read through them kind of quick now, so pay attention. Follow after charity, verse 1. Desire spiritual gifts, but rather, but rather, rather. Everybody say rather, <laughs> and I don't mean Dan rather, rather prophecy. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men but unto God. That is not a prayer language. It does not say he's praying in an unknown tongue. It says he's speaking in an unknown tongue. And he's speaking in such a way to where those around him don't understand what he's saying. So an unknown tongue is unknown to the hearer. It don't mean the one speaking it's unknown to. Remember, on the day of Pentecost, when they were preaching, they spoke with other tongues. They knew exactly what they were saying. The hearers knew what they were saying, too. They couldn't understand how all these languages were suddenly learned by men that were Galileans. And it confused them. Keep reading. 
He speaketh to the unknown tongue, speaketh not unto men, but unto God, for no man understandeth him, how be it the Spirit. He speaketh mysteries. But he that prophesies speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. I would that you all speak with, notice it does not say unknown tongues. If I have a missionary from Africa come, and a missionary from Russia come, and a missionary from the Ukraine come, they all are going to come here, and there's going to need to be an interpreter. But if I had all of them come here, and they all started talking to you, without the interpreter present, y'all would not get any edification out of the matter. They might, because they know what they're saying to you. But you don't understand what they're saying to you. See what I mean? Keep reading. All right, the Bible says, uh, He that speaketh in unknown tongues, well, excuse me, I will that you all speak with tongues, but rather that you prophesy. For greater is he that prophesied than he that speaketh with tongues, except, here it is, he interprets, that the church may receive edifying. Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine? Now, let me ask you something. Where do you get your revelation from? Where do you get your knowledge from? Where do you get your prophesying from? Where do you get your doctrine from? <laughs> See what Paul's doing there? He's pushing them back to a place where they go to the Scriptures. Keep reading. Even things without life giving sound with a pipe or heart, except they give a distinction in the sound, how shall it be known what is pipe or heart? For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? So likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye speak into the air. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. <clears throat> that is Pentecostal churches today. Get in there, <laughs> and they'll all get around the altar, and they'll start talking in tongues. Nobody knows anything about what anybody's saying. But they're praying. Nobody's getting any edifying. They're getting an emotional high. Now, what Paul is saying here is you got to utter things that are be understood so that there's edification given to the congregation. Look at verse 12. Even so, so much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that you may excel to the edifying of the church. Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. If a man comes in from Africa and he don't have an interpreter and he starts wanting to give the gospel to you, he is to pray for God to give him an interpretation of what he's saying to you in a language that you can understand. That's what Paul's saying. <clears throat> now, keep reading. If I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. Now, the understanding there is not unfruitful to the one speaking, but the one hearing. See, what is it then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. This is the problem we have with Roman Catholic churches in the traditional Latin Mass, is they get up and they do the Latin Mass on Sunday morning, and there's no interpreter, and they say everything from start to finish in Latin. And the congregation has no clue what's being said whatsoever. So how in the world they think they're getting any kind of benefit out of that is beyond finding out. Alright. <clears throat> Else, when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say amen at thy giving of thanks? We've seen that plenty of times in Pentecostal churches. They start talking in tongues and people over there clapping, amen, amen. You have no idea what they're saying. They could be cursing God. 
there has been recordings in some of these places where that actually has happened. Mm -hmm. All right. Let me keep going. Oh, uh, let's see. Now look over here. Um, <coughs> excuse me. In verse 17, for thou verily, uh, let's see, verse 16, else when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say amen at thy giving of thanks, seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest? For thou verily giveth thanks well, but the other is not edified. I thank my God I speak with tongues. Notice he does not say unknown tongues. He says, I thank God I speak with tongues. See that thing? More than you all, yet in the church. I'd rather speak five words with my understanding that my voice that I might teach others than ten thousand words in an unknown tongue. Brethren, be not children in understanding. Howbeit malice be ye children, in understanding be men. And the Lord is written, With men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people. And yet for all that they will not hear me, saith the Lord. Wherefore, now here's what you want to note. note tongues are for a sign. The gift of tongues is a sign gift. What do you mean by that, preacher? I mean... It's a sign to Israel. See that part where it says, with other tongues, he speak to this people? That's what happened on Pentecost. Every time in the book of Acts, the gift of tongues shows up, there are Jews present somewhere in the crowd. And God is letting that Jew know that God has redeemed them. And he's accepted the Gentiles into his body. Go back and read the book of Acts. All right, now look at this. Not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serves not for them that believe not, but for them that which believe. That would be you and me. If therefore the whole church be come together into one place, and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that you're a man? Yes, they will. I've seen many of lost people run out of the church, scared to death, when they go in a Pentecostal charismatic church and see this kind of stuff going on, and they never come back to church again. That's absolutely true. And Paul knew exactly that because that's what he wrote here. All right, but if I'll prophesy, there come in that believeth not, or one unlearned, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all, and thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest. So falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation, that all things be done unto edifying. Now watch this. Here's the rules. Any man speaking in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. Now here's what he said. I did not say this. God said this. When you speak in tongues, if you're going to have the rule. Here's what you got to do. You got one, two, three at the most that speak. And they can't all speak at the same time. This one has to speak and then sit down. This one has to speak and then sit down. And then this one has to speak and then sit down. That's what the word by course means. It means in order of um, lineup. You got one here, he's going to speak, and then he sits down. Yeah, well, here he speaks. He, now, let me ask you, how many of those churches that do that kind of stuff ever do that? They have about 10 to 15 people, and we're going to get into this in a minute, and most of them, guess what, are women. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we're going to talk about that in a minute. <laughs> Look at verse 28. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself to God. If you ain't got no interpreter in the church to interpret what you're saying, even if you do by course of three, you're still not to speak. Alright, keep reading. Let the prophet speak two or three, and let the other judge. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. For you may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn, and all may be comforted. And the spirits of the prophet are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. 
Verse 34. Read this carefully. Read it carefully and use this to discern what's going on around you in Christianity today. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. Now, I have showed this to several, several, not just a few, several Pentecostals, and they snub that verse and come back at me and say, well, that was Paul's opinion. Is that right? I guess it wasn't inspired by God. No. That's what they're basically saying when they say that. Well, let's keep reading. For it is not permitted in them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. They will learn anything. Let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for, one, for women to speak in the church. What? Came the word of God out from you, or came it unto you only? Did any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual? Now watch it. I show them this. I let them, I let them bait the hook. I bait them real good with that first part. I don't show them this next part, Brother Jack, until they say that to me about, well, that's Paul's opinion. Then I bring them down to this verse right here in verse 37. Well, that's interesting that you would say that because of what verse 37 says. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. That don't sound like an opinion. <laughs> All right. Let's go over here to Romans chapter 12. We take a little long with this one, but you need to look. I'm going to teach y'all on this one and go through this in great detail. <clears throat> you got the gifts of the Spirit listed over here in Romans 12, verse 6 through verse um, 13. Having the gifts of differing according to the grace that is given to us, where the prophecy let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Of ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness, let love be without dissimulation, abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good, be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another, not slothful in business, Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of the saints, given to hospitality. Now go back up here to verse um, Let's see. Now let's go to um, Mark. We'll go, we'll hit this one last. Mark chapter sixteen. called the sign gifts given to Israel. Those you read in Romans chapter 12 are gifts that are still applicable to the church today. Everything you read in Romans 12 can apply to us. What you're reading over there in 1 Corinthians 14 and 1 Corinthians 12 could apply in relationship to the Word of God but there are things there that Paul is dealing with that are concerning the sign, just namely tongues. Now let's see what it says over here. <clears throat> uh, Mark 16. And look down here at verse um, 17. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. Alright? They will cast out devils. So you got Bob Larson out here casting out devils. <laughs> I mean, that's what he focuses his whole ministry on. All right, but he, he quit reading. The Bible says, they shall speak with... What's that next part say? New tongues. That's during the millennium. The Bible says God will give them a pure language. Remember that one? This has nothing to do with the church age. This is a millennial passage. 
and the devil's being cast out. In my name they shall cast out devils. Let's go back there real quick. Go to Zechariah 13. I'll show you where the devils get cast out and what it references. Zechariah 13, 1 and 2. One in that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols out of the land, and they shall no more be remembered. And also I will cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to pass out of the land. And if you read Matthew chapter 12, you'll know that that unclean spirit has a plural nature to him. We are legion, for we are many. There's your casting out of devils. Let's go to the name, um, excuse me, <clears throat> the new tongues. Go to Zephaniah 3 9. Zephaniah 3 9. Not Zechariah, but Zephaniah. Zephaniah 3 9. Talking about the millennium. For then will I, uh, chapter 3, verse 9, for then will I turn to the people a what? Say a thing. They may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him. With one consent, God is going to redeem the language. This redemption thing goes so far beyond just you being saved from hell. In the millennium, God is going to restore the animal kingdom to its former state. He's going to restore the, the uh, vegetation kingdom to its former state. He's going to restore the language to its pure state. Because the language itself has been corrupted by sin. So Jesus Christ said these signs shall follow. The Jews require a sign according to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'll show it to you in a little bit. But let's keep reading. <clears throat> Alright. You see this part next that says they shall take up surface. i got a question for you. These people that love to run to Mark 16 to talk about new tongues and all that and casting out devils, why don't they take up serpents? It's in the same verse. It's in the same context. Well, let's see what the Bible says about that. Go to Isaiah 11. Let's see what God says about these serpents. Isaiah 11. Isaiah 11, verses 8 and 9. Let's go back a few verses so we can get some context. Verse 1. There shall come forth the rod of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, and the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. There's the seven spirits of God right there. And they shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor, and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be in the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the kid and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together and a little child shall lead them <clears throat> and the cow and the bear shall feed their young ones shall lie down together and the lion shall eat straw like the ox and the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den which is a serpent they shall not hurt nor destroy 
in all thy holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That matches what you read in Mark 16. That's where you compare Scripture with Scripture, and the Bible defines what it's talking about. Let's keep reading. The Bible says here, If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. All right. <clears throat> let's go down here to, let's see, Isaiah 55. I got a bunch of verses on this. I'll give them to you, but I'm not going to read them all. So if you want to write them down, I'll give them to you. I got Isaiah 11, 9, Matthew 26, 29, Mark 14, 25, the one we're getting ready to read in Isaiah 55, 1 through 3. The Bible says, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. He that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat, yea, come, buy wine and milk, without money, without price. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread, and you labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me. Eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear, and come unto me here, and your soul shall live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. All right, go down here to Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32. In Deuteronomy 32, we're going to look at verse 33. The Bible talks about, <clears throat> let's go back to verse uh, 31. For their rock is not as our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. For their vine is of the vine of Sodom and of the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of ass. Is not this laid up in store with me and sealed up among my treasures? To me belongeth vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time. For the day of their calamity is at hand, and the thing shall come upon them make haste. <clears throat> in the millennium, that is restored. See, when Noah got off that boat, that grapevine that he was drinking off before he got on the boat didn't produce the same kind of wine that it produced after he got off the boat. Hence, he wound up drunk had a little bit more punch to it. So in the millennium, that thing's going to be restored back to its pure state. All right. Some other verses you can look up and compare is Amos 9.13, Revelation 8.11, and 2 Kings 4.38-41. All right, the last thing it says here is they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall... Not maybe. Not if you have enough faith, brother. Not if you have faith in your faith. It says they shall, brother Jack, recover. So I asked these guys that claim to have the gift of healing, come on with me and let's go to the hospital. Why, why preacher? But we're going to see. We're going to the cancer ward. Why are we going there? Because I want you to lay hands on everybody that you come in contact with and raise them up. We can't do that, preacher. Why not? You claim to have the gift of healing. A man that has the apostolic sign gift of healing can lay hands on the sick and they shall, not maybe, not might, not if that person has faith or don't have faith, they shall recover. You see what I'm saying? That's what he's talking about. It's not a situation, brother, where I come and pray for you and God heals you. But sometimes he might and sometimes he may not. Amen. Alright, this is a different scenario here. I believe in healing. I believe that God heals. Supernaturally sometimes. 
But I also believe he uses doctors sometimes. Sometimes I believe he uses medicine. Paul traveled the end of his life with a physician named Luke. Why? He had to have to start and got the sign gift right. He did. But when God turned away from the Jews, the sign gifts ceased. He said, I left one over there sick, dying to death. Going to Timothy. Why didn't he heal him? Because the sign gift had left. Because God stopped dealing with those Jews. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. This will help you put it all together. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Alright. And let's look at... Let's see. Verse 22. The nation of Israel began with signs. Remember that. It's the first thing God told Moses. Take your hand, stick it in your bosom, pull it out. Leper. I got leprosy on my hand. All right, let's stick it back in there. Stick it back in there. Pull it back out. It's, it's healed. You take that rod in your hand, Moses. You lay it on the ground and it turns into a serpent. Okay, pick it up. Picks it up. Turns back into a rod. That's a sign gift. The nation of Israel began with signs. You don't require signs as a believer. You walk by faith, not by sight. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and go down here to verse 22. See that? For the Jews, and I don't mean the church, require a sign. So tell me something. Why are these preachers out here pushing for people to run after signs and wonders? You're not told to do that in the Bible. Only one group of people in the Bible required to run and require a sign, and that's the Jews, the nation of Israel. Look at what God says about the Greeks. And the Greeks seek after wisdom. But look at the next verse. But we, that's you, if you say, <laughs> what are you supposed to be doing? See the difference? Now, when God needs a gift to show up, He'll make sure it shows up when it's supposed to show up. But Christians are not supposed to be seeking after this stuff. And most of this stuff that's going on in churches today is out of order. So that lets you know right off the bat that it's not of God. It's either emotional, uh, misleadings, some of it can be demonic, some of it is just people just out in left field. I don't know how to explain it. I watched a lady go down the aisle one time in a church in a revival that me and Carrie were doing. And when she walked down that aisle, she was talking in tongues, and she did this right here. She had her fingers up like that right there, and she jerked them back like that, and she rolled her head back like that, and her eyes rolled in the back of her head, and she started talking in tongues. That's satanic, folks. You know what the church was doing? Glory to God, glory to God. No, there's no glory to God in that, sister. You have no discernment. You need to know when it's God moving and when it's Satan moving. You need to know the difference between what's really God moving in a service and what's really Satan moving. The Holy Ghost never brings attention to himself. Go to John chapter 16. I know we go a little long on that one question, but <laughs> John 16. Look at verse 13. Let me know when you get there. John 16. John 16, 13. 
how be it? When He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. The Holy Ghost will never lead you into error. He will always lead you to the Holy Scriptures because that's where the truth is. The Bible says, For He shall not speak of Himself. So when you got these people out here, the Holy Ghost, 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 the Holy Ghost. You better be, you better take a step back from that. Because when the real Holy Ghost shows up, He's pointing you to Christ every time. Christ, Christ crucified, Christ preached. Look at it. But whatsoever He shall hear, that shall He speak. He will show you things to come. He shall glorify Me. For he shall receive a mind and shall show it unto you. The Holy Ghost, when he shows up, he gets you in that book right there. And he says, read that. Let me show you something in that. Let me reveal something in my word to you about that. Let me glorify Christ. That's the real Holy Ghost. That's the difference. And it's very subtle. Because people that don't know this, when they get up in a service and they hear this stuff going on, they I really moved today. Listen, I've heard this before. Let me tell you. I've heard them say this so many times. The Holy Ghost showed up in our church today and we didn't have any preaching. Well, that wasn't the Holy Ghost, sister. The Holy Ghost will never stop preaching to show off. Mm -hmm. But I've heard them say it a million times, Brother Earl. Oh, we, we had a good service day. The Holy Ghost took over, and we didn't even have no preaching. Well, that's a shame. It's a shame you're that ignorant and that stupid to believe that was the Holy Ghost that stopped the preaching of the Word of God. The Holy Ghost don't stop the preaching of the Scriptures. The Holy Ghost glorifies the Scriptures, according to this verse. So... You've got two groups of gifts there, brother. You've got the sign gifts that were given to Israel, which is in Mark 16, <clears throat> that show up in the early church before the canon closes, before the scriptures are closed. And then you've got the ordinary gifts that the Holy Spirit puts into a man, also found in Ephesians chapter 4, the ministering gifts that focus around this. Did that answer your question? I hope so. <laughs> All right. We got five minutes. Anybody got a question? <laughs> Brother Jack? I was going to ask you about, uh, about repentance. Okay. What must I do to be saved? Uh huh. Do you want me to define what? Repentance is? Well, I, you, know, you, hear, you hear people say... Repenting your sins. They're saved by faith alone. Yep. In Christ. Right. I think I know what you're asking. And I don't, I don't say saved by faith alone. I say by faith. Two faith. It's not our faith that saves us, it's the faith of Christ. Right. What is repentance? See, this is where you have to define that word first. Because in the Bible, God repents. Now, what does it mean? See, if you define repentance as um, giving up your sins, you know, people say, repent of your sins. If you ain't repented of your sins, you're not saved. Well, that's not scriptural. Ain't no way in the Bible it says that. It's not scriptural. When the Bible says that you have to repent, we got to define the word. It means to have a change of mind and heart about something. So, when I present the gospel to you, brother, and you're a lost man, and I present Christ to you for the first time, 
<laughs> and you've been trusting your own righteousness to get you to heaven, and now you see that the righteousness comes from Jesus Christ and what He did for you at the cross, and you have a change of mind about that, you are turning to God from this over here. You're having a change of mind about what you used to think versus what you now think. That's biblical repentance. There's an excellent book that was written, and I'm trying to remember the gentleman that wrote it from Brother Ruckman's church. I have to go home and look at it. He wrote a whole dissertation on this. How churches and, and people in congregations get so mixed up on this, and they wind up in a works-based salvation situation because they think, well, i got to repent of this first. When they don't understand what repentance biblically means, when God repents, He's not because He sinned. He had a change of mind about something based on what people did and responded to. The Bible says we're to have repentance toward God. That means to take it about faith. Okay? Samuel, sit. Alright, hold on, I'll give you the verses on it. Because this is important to get, and that's a good question, brother. By the way, um, that a lot of people don't have a good understanding on. Uh, let's see. All right, there's two verses I want you to uh, let's see. Repentance toward God. Let's see. Go to Acts chapter 20, verse 21. Acts chapter 20, verse 21. We'll have to hold the other questions if anybody's got into until next week. And we'll keep that on going. 2021. All right, look at this verse here. It says, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance, what's that next part say? Toward God. Okay. All right. And faith toward going in the direction of Jesus Christ is basically what he's saying. In other words, you're going down this way you have a change of mind, so you turn around and you start going this way. That's repentance. Repentance is not, I gotta quit drinking, I gotta quit smoking, I gotta quit, I gotta quit cussing, I gotta quit all these things before I can come to God. If not, I haven't really repented. I had a guy in our church one time, he believed that because he was in the old fundamentalist Baptist school to believe that if you're really saved, all those things go away. If you didn't have the fruits, <laughs> as he called them, you weren't saved. All right, let's look at another one here on this, and then we'll close with this one. Go to 2 Corinthians. 7. Second Corinthians 7. Verse 9. Now rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner that you might receive damage by us in nothing. <laughs> For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. See, the sorrow of the world says this. I got to give up my sins. I got to give up all these things before I can come to Christ. So I have a sorrow in that matter. So I start justifying myself based on what I gave up before I came to Christ. So it becomes a Pharisaical kind of attitude. Whereas the godly sorrow says, I am not sorry, not just for what I've done, 
I'm sorry for what I am. And I'm turning to God with it now. Does that kind of answer what you're... Yeah, I, well, I mean, I, I pretty much understood that. I mean, okay. I, mean, I, just, I just wanted you know, to, to expound on it a little bit. Okay. Maybe you can do that next week. Yeah, we can do that. Expound on it a little bit. A little bit more, okay. Uh, yeah, we can do that. Um, did I kind of cover the main oh, yeah. I mean, part of it? Okay. Yeah, but I mean, it's, it's, I feel like it'd be something good that you Get to get a good understanding on it. Because that is a subject, folks. I'm going to tell you, a lot of people in churches have a misunderstanding on it, and it's repentance. And it's repentance. They try to take... Um, As the Bible says, except you repent, you shall all like one. That's right. Yeah, but was it, it says that in Revelation. It, it, it sure does. But context, where he's saying it, who he's saying it to, and what he's saying to them, except you repent. Now, what does he mean there? You gotta have a change of heart. Right. You can't keep going along thinking I can do something to help God out to get to heaven. You're gonna be lost as a goose. Her son in law, we were talking to him last weekend. Uh huh. See? He's gotta repent of that. And supposedly they're coming to church with us Sunday. Okay. okay. And I hope this crazy thing because they need Jesus back. That whole we're going to be on the cross Sunday, so we'll, we'll be hammering the cross in a crucifixion. Yeah, we're going to be on the cross Sunday, so we'll, 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 we'll be hammering the cross and the crucifixion and the resurrection, so. Well, we're going to eat hunting some eggs afterwards. Only if you provide them. Well, I got plenty of eggs. I mean, all you got to do is go out there and find them. <laughs> If I didn't have some over there in the neighbor's yard, brother, if you want to take a risk and go over there. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to close right there. Brother Chuck, did you have a question that you want to hold off till next week? <laughs> I didn't know if you had a question. If so, just hold it till next week. Okay. All right. Did y'all learn anything on this today? I know I went a little long on that, but those two subjects there need, need to be taught on in, in, in churches to get a good understanding on and a lot of this confusion will end, you know. Um, but repentance is one of them, brother, and that's a, that's a good one. I'm glad you brought that up. So yes, we do need to hit that. So remind me to do that a little bit more next week because I want to hit that a little bit heavier because repentance is something important. I don't think we've talked about that seriously since this. With this group, right. So we need to hit it. We need to hit it. I might do a series on it. Repentance, what it means, and who is he talking to, and what does it mean when he says it here? You know, because when I tell people that God repented, that changes, that blows their mind, because their mindset is, if I'm repenting, I'm repenting of something bad I've done. That's not repentance, though. That's not what the word means. The <laughs> word repentance means to have a change of mind about something whether good or bad, you know. And that's why Paul said it the way he did here in First uh, Second Corinthians 17. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your blessings today. We thank you for your grace, your mercy, your love, your goodness. Lord, until we come together again, keep us safe, covered in the blood of Jesus, under your protection, Lord. Thank you for this gathering tonight and for those who are hungry for your word tonight. We appreciate everybody that's here. We just pray you watch over them, Lord. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. All right, Brother Chuck. Thank you for calling. All right. Thank you, man. All right. Bye-bye.